can go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Dalia Castillo Granados, and I'm the director of SILA. Um, and my presentation today is going to be about key federal statutes and litigation. So we're going to go over the Flores Settlement Agreement um, and then talk about some federal statutes. So I tried, I tried to just keep it um, in order of, of what happened. Um, and then we're going to talk about another um, uh, federal litigation that's really important for our work, which is the Paris Solano Settlement Agreement. Um, and then at the end, I just have some, some tips for research that we'll go over. All right, so much like today, um, children from Central America were coming across an increasing number um, on their own in the, mid, in the early and mid 1980s. Um, a civil war was raging in Guatemala um, in the early 80s. There had been a military coup in 1982, and thousands of people were being killed. A civil war was also raging in El Salvador. Um, the government forces and death squads were also killing many people in that country. Um, Honduras uh, was spared from some of the bloody civil wars of its neighbors, but there was still extrajudicial um, killings that were going on of leftist supporters. Um, so much like today, Central America uh, was dealing with a lot of issues, and many people left Central America, um, and then children either followed or, or came first, and so were entering the country um, on their own. So back, back in the 80s, there was no national policy for the detention and release of unaccompanied children. So each INS office had its own policy. Um, and the reason for even the start of the litigation was that the Western Regional Office of the INS instituted a policy allowing the release of children only to parents or legal guardians. So the government claims that the policy was put into place to protect children, but what was really happening was that when a parent or a legal guardian came to claim their children and they had no legal status, then INS was arresting and deporting these people. So when the news spread about this practice, um, parents or legal guardians you know, stopped going to claim their children. They wanted somebody else to go claim their children. I mean, we see it happen today as well. Um, you know, they had um, maybe like a family friend or a relative with status try to try to go and get that child out of detention. And the INS was saying, no, we're not gonna we're not gonna release the child to anybody else but a parent or a legal guardian. Um, so this was a serious problem not only because of course detention is bad for children, but also because the the conditions in the detention facilities were absolutely terrible. Um, there's a recent article um, in the ABA Journal um, that um, interviews Car Carlos Hogan, um, and he talks about you know some of his life work. He's the um, the lead attorney on this case on the Flores Settlement Agreement and the Paris Alano Settlement Agreement. Um, but in any case, he talks about a facility that he visited in the early 80s um, that was basically an old motel. So what INS had done um, is basically drain the pool of this motel, put up a fence with barbed wire and just put everybody that they caught in there, women, men, and children. Um, so there was no separation of adults or genders. Um, children had no right to visitation, no right to education, no right to recreation. Um, and probably most egregiously, they were subject to strip searches and even body cavity searches. So things were, were definitely really terrible um, for these kids. So in 1985, um, four respondents filed in federal court uh, and asked for a class to be certified, um, which was granted. Um, and the complaint raised four claims. So the first two challenged the release policy, and then the final five challenged the conditions of detention. Um, in 1987, the government actually um, agreed to a settlement on the detention conditions. Um, so basically in this settlement agreement, in this consent decree, what the government said was that they would provide for state licensed facilities with counseling, with education, recreation, family reunification services, 
um, and also access to visitors and legal assistance. Um, so, you know, this, at least the conditions, um, some of that, some of those issues were settled really early on. Um, in 1988, there was like, there was a um, really early win in, in this case here, um, and that uh, took care of the strip searches and the body cavity searches. Um, basically, the, the district court found that the INS, the, the INS policy of routinely strip searching and juveniles um, violated their Fourth Amendment rights, and also that INS could not conduct strip searches absent reasonable suspicion. So that this was um, a really good victory early on for them. And so this, this part of the lawsuit, at least, was um, resolved. Um, another thing that happened during the dependency of all of this litigation is that in 1988, INS promulgated regulations for the release of children. So INS, in 1987, had proposed a rule and had taken comments. Um, the Federal Register from, from, this, uh, from these regulations says that um, the rule is required because of a dramatic increase in juveniles, which around that time was about seven or 8,000 per year. Um, and the, and it, it allowed release to adult relatives, but only to unrelated adults in unusual and compelling circumstances, because the INS claimed that they did not have the resources or the expertise to conduct home studies. Um, so it also, one of the other things that the re regulation did is that it required placement in a shelter care facility unless none was available in which a child could be placed, in which case the child would be placed in a juvenile correctional facility, but apart from the general population. Um, also in this regulation, the INS recognizes that the principal factor bearing upon release or detention of a juvenile is their likelihood of appearance at future proceedings. So on the one hand, they say they can't release juveniles to um, people other than parents or legal guardians or, or relatives, and the regulations now contemplate relatives as well. Um, but on the other hand, they say that the reason why they're deciding whether or not to release a child is based on whether or not that child will show up for court. So the class was successful at the district court level um, in challenging this new regulation, um, and then the government appealed. So in 1990, the Ninth Circuit reversed the district court's ruling and found that INS did not exceed its authority in publishing and issuing the regulation, and that the regulation did not violate substantive due process, um, and that the Fourth Amendment requirement that there was that there should be a review of um, of, a, of the arrest uh, did not apply to, to children. Um, in 1991, though, a majority of the active judges on the Ninth Circuit voted, voted to hear, rehear the case in Bonk um, and affirmed the district court's ruling that the detention policy, according to the regulation, was unlawful. So they overturned that previous Ninth Circuit um, court case. And of course, the government appealed. So that's how we get all the way up to the Supreme Court. So we have this case, uh, Reno v. Flores, and the government won. So um, the, the case is from 1993. Justice Scalia delivered the opinion, um, and Justice Stevens and Blackman were the only ones that, um, that joined in a dissenting opinion, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, so first, the first thing that the court did was dismiss any challenge to detention conditions because it said, well, you already have a, uh, you already have a consent decree that, um, that has all these rules for, for the detention of children. Um, part of the reason they did that is because they cite to a bunch of, a, a lot of amicus briefing that talks about how terrible detention conditions were. And so basically the court says, well, you already have this consent decree, so if you don't, you're not, satisfied with the conditions of detention, then you need to go and try to enforce compliance with your consent decree. Um, so the Supreme Court decision does not talk about detention conditions at all. It just focuses on the regulation that was promulgated in 1988. Um, so the court treated the argument for the respondents as a facial challenge to the regulation since the regulation was new and had not been applied to any particular case. So because of that, the court said that the respondents must establish that no set of circumstances 
um, that there's no set of circumstances where the regulation would be valid. And the court found that the, the, the um, respondents, which are the kids of the class in this case, um, could not do that. Um, secondly, the court found that the regulation did not violate the due process clause. So on the substantive due process, um, they found that the regulation didn't deprive them, didn't deprive the respondents of substantive due process um, because the court asserted that the substantive right that was asserted by the children was the right of a child to be placed with an unrelated adult in, instead of government detention. And the court found, of course, that this is not a fundamental right. Um, so the court said it was enough that the regulation is rationally connected to the government's interest in preserving the welfare of detained juveniles and is not punitive. So that, that took care of substantive due process. Um, the court also said that the children do not have a substantive right to have a hearing to decide whether the detention is, is in their best interest, as long as the institutional custody is good enough. So that part of the ruling is going to be really important to the settlement agreement, um, the fact that the custody had to be good enough. And on procedural due process grounds, the court found that the right to review detention by an immigration judge um, provides juveniles with procedural due process. So at the time of apprehension, a juvenile, and this practice still goes on even today, um, but at the time of the deten uh, apprehension, at the time of apprehension, a juvenile has this document, it's called a notice of custody determination, and they have to check on there, although it's a computerized check, so the, the, the ICE official checks it for them. Um, but they decide whether or not they want an immigration judge to determine, redetermine their bond. Um, so, of course, the, the immigration official is saying, no bond, you're going into, um, into detention, and they choose whether or not an IJ would redetermine that. So this is going to be important um, for, for some, um, some of the later litigation that we're going to talk about. And then finally, the Supreme Court said, that the regulation didn't exceed the scope of the government's discretion. It rationally pursues a lawful purpose, according to the court, and it strikes a balance between the government's concern over the juvenile's welfare and their assessment that they don't have the expertise or resources to conduct home studies, because that's one of the things that the INS said. Um, they, couldn't, they couldn't release kids to unrelated adults because they don't have, they're not able to conduct home studies and they don't know if the child will be safe in that, um, in that placement. Um, so like I said, Stevens and Blackman dissented um, with, with the majority. Um, and Stevens, who wrote the dissenting opinion, had some really great points. Of course, I would think that. Um, so they, one of the things that Stevens said is that the court attacks the best interest of the child as a right. Um, by which to judge the INS policy, but it's exactly that interest that the INS said is the reason why they can't release the children to an unrelated adult. So it doesn't make sense. Um, and so the court, so what what Stevens was saying was that basically the INS can't prove that it's the policy would be in the juvenile's best interest. So then the court gives them an out and has and basically justifies the INS policy because there's other interests that outweigh the juvenile's um, best interest. Um, so it's a really interesting uh, opinion, um, and I would encourage you to, to read the whole, the whole opinion. Uh, but the great thing about this is that the case was remanded um, to, to kind of, um, of course, for further litigation to kind of settle some of these issues. And out of that, four years after the Supreme Court decision came before a settlement agreement. Um, so, as I mentioned before, also the, the there was there had been a previous settlement agreement in 1987 that set out some of the conditions um, for kids. So there was also this motion to enforce that settlement agreement. So this the Florida settlement agreement takes care of everything of all the pending litigation, and then also that enforcement decree of the previous settlement agreement. Um, the agreement starts out, and the reason you know it, this is. The Florida Settlement Agreement is really important in terms of um, setting out 
the, the conditions, the um, rules for the conditions of, of detention, um, and it's still active today. So this is why it's so important to, to make sure that we all know this and go over it as well. Um, so the agreement starts with a, a list of definitions, and one of the definitions in there is the definition of a minor. Um, so it covers all minors that are defined here in the settlement agreement. And the minor is any person under the age of 18 who is detained in the legal custody of INS. So does anybody know what word is missing from there? Unaccompanied. So unaccompanied is not there. So it covers any child um, in the custody of, of INS. Um, so this is important for some, some litigation that happens later on. So one of the most cited provisions of the Florida Settlement Agreement is the least restrictive setting. Um, of course, it's not just least restrictive setting. Um, there are some government interests that have to be balanced with that. So the exact language um, of that provision is that the INS shall place each detained minor in the least restrictive setting appropriate to the minor's age and special needs, provided that such a setting is consistent with its interest to ensure the minor's timely appearance before the INS and the immigration courts and to protect the minor's well-being and that of others. So this is why, um, even though the child is in detention custody, um, they can't just, you can't just get a child out because that would be the least restrictive setting. They also have to balance these other interests as well. Um, so the floor settlement agreement also talks about apprehension. So when the children are apprehended, usually at the border, um, the government must provide the minor with a notice of right, um, including that right to a bond redetermination. Uh, so I've seen the paper before when the kid, you know, Bert comes with his packet of information and there's the notice of um, of uh, custody determination, um, and it's always checked no, that the child decided not to pursue a redetermination of bond with the immigration judge. But now there's actually an enforcement motion um, that Carl, Carlos Holgan filed, and it's to enforce this provision of the floor settlement agreement, that a child does have a right um, to a bond redetermination. Um, and the waiver is revocable, so even if the child supposedly find checked no, they don't want a bond redetermination. At any time during detention, a child could, um, could still ask for a bond redetermination. So I guess this is important in cases where a child is having a hard time getting out of detention, um, you know, for any number of reasons, um, then they could ask the judge um, to, to give them a bond redetermination. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. I mean, the language is pretty clear in the, in the settlement agreement, so I think um, um, I think some plaintiffs have a good shot. So I think it will be settled. Um, the one of the other things about apprehension is that here we have some um, requirements, such as the facilities must have access to toilets and sinks, drinking water and food, medical assistance and emergencies, adequate temperature control. So I know we heard a lot when the search happened in 2014 about some of the conditions um, of, that the children were being held in right after apprehension. Um, they call the, you know, where they are held the yalera, which means there's obviously not temperature control. Um, so this is all part of the settlement agreement. Um, I know there was a lot of complaints that went up for the, the children that had been detained, but of course, the government found that there was no violation. Um, the, the minor must also be transferred to placement within three days, um, except if there's an emergency or influx situation. And then there's a general policy favoring relief. Um, if detention is not required to secure timely appearance or for the minor or other safety, then the government shall release the minor. Um, and of course, there's a list of preferences from parent to legal guardian, adult relative, and then other um, other individuals, as long as they're designated by the parent or legal guardian. Um, an affidavit of support is required. The settlement talks about the affidavit of support in the form number. Um, it's, it's 
what our the sponsor care agreement is now. Um, and of course, it contemplates suitability assessment to the home study. So if the government decides that a home study is necessary, then, um, then it can be conducted. And it also says that family reunification efforts shall continue as long as the child's in detention. So the, the shelter can never stop trying to reunify the child. Um, there's also a whole section in there about custody, so the secure placement. So if a child does have a delinquency issue or is disruptive or try to run away or something like that, then they can be placed in more secure facilities. Um, but um, the reasons for the placement must be outlined for the minor. Um, and also the minor can seek judicial review in federal district court for placement in any particular type of setting. So it does um, give the child some rights there. Um, like I said before, the, so initially in, in the original Florida Settlement Agreement, it, it was supposed to terminate after five years of final approval or after three years of substantial compliance. Um, but in 2001, there was um, an enforcement motion, and so the order was amended to say that the Florida Settlement Agreement is in force until 45 days after the INS passes regulations to enforce compliance with the Florida Settlement Agreement. So that has not happened. Um, and I actually didn't know this until I was researching for this presentation, but the, uh, the government actually proposed regulations that were supposed to be in compliance with the Florida Settlement Agreement um, in 1997. Um, so they proposed the regulations, they took comments, and then never promulgated the regulations. So what's it been now? I mean, it's been, it's been um, almost 20 years, and the regulations just never came out. I'm not sure what the backstory of that is. But in any case, the, there are regulations about custody, um, custody of juveniles, but, and you can find those at um, ACFR 236.3. But these are basically the same regulations that were promulgated in 1988. So the, the whole reason that they, you know, the parties went to um, continue the litigation and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, those regulations are still in place now. Um, so we talked about what, how the minor is defined in the Florida Settlement Agreement. So it's important um, in cases where a child is detained in um, a family residential facility. So like Pedo, um, that a family residential facility, and, and, and now, like the other ones that we have um, currently. So in 2015, the plaintiffs moved to enforce the settlement agreement because ICE breached the decree by adopting a no-release policy with respect to Central American families and confining minors in secure, unlicensed facilities. Um, so we know that after the surge in 2014, um, the government opened up uh, three different detention facilities, one in um, Carn City in Dilly, um, Artesia, which later closed. Um, and then there's also another um, facility somewhere in the northeast, Pennsylvania maybe. Um, Burke, Burke, um, the facility there. So all of these facilities, um, that's the bit with the plaintiffs moved to enforce the settlement for the kids that were being detained there with their families. So what, what the plaintiffs were saying was that the new, the new facilities were not, um, were not complying with the settlement. Um, and the government's position was that the settlement only applies to unaccompanied children and not to accompanied children. Um, but the court found that the plain language of the settlement agreement clearly encompasses accompanied children. Um, and so one of the bad things, because this case went all the way, Boris B. Lynch went all the way to the Ninth Circuit, um, but one of the downsides is that the court also found that the settlement doesn't provide any explicit rights to adults, um, even though it gives preferential treatment to the release to a parent of the child. So even if a child is able to be released because, of course, the, the facilities aren't complying with the terms of the settlement agreement, that doesn't mean that their parents will also be released. Um, which could definitely lead to some issues, especially if the kid doesn't, if the child doesn't have anybody else to be released to. The court also found no reason to amend the before settlement agreement. So one of the arguments the government made was that there's so many changes now. You know, we weren't expecting all of these family units to be coming over. Well, the court said, too bad. 
just because there was an unanticipated surge of families doesn't mean that we're going to amend the settlement agreement. Um, just because there was the Homeland Security Act of 2002 and the TDPRA of 2008 doesn't mean that we're going to um, modify the settlement. Um, so the Berks, the Berks County facility is actually state licensed, um, but just recently in February, their state Department of, Health, of Human Services declined to renew their license. Um, of course, the government appealed, and now it's, um, it's being resolved in an administrative proceeding. And another thing that was interesting that I didn't know was that in 2006 with the Hado facility, which is no longer a family residential facility, um, there was actually a suit in the Western District of Texas on behalf of three children that argued that, the, that this facility violated their rights under the Forest Settlement Agreement. And the district court found in their favor. Um, so it, the exact same thing. The government, you know, um, argued that it didn't apply to unaccompanied children, and the court said, no, it does. Obviously, look at the definition of a minor, um, but also rejected the idea that a parent should also be released at the same time. So this is not the first time that this happened for a family residential facility, um, so I don't think it should have surprised the government, and I don't understand how they were able to open up another facility if they had already had the school tour. All right, so we're going to move on to some federal statutes. Um, just the, the Homeland Security Act of 2002 and the CDPRA of 2008 before we talk a little bit about the Paris Solano Settlement Agreement. All right, so um, after 9-11, Congress decided to abolish the INS. So no more INS, they created the Department of Homeland Security and the three agencies that go along with it, which handle the immigration um, provision. So we all know this, right? It's USCIS, which handles adjudications, ICE, which is the enforcement branch, and then CBP, which handles um, the flow of people and goods across borders. Um, the other important change that came out of the Homeland Security Act of 2002 is that it transferred the care of unaccompanied children from INS to ORR. Um, so before, before the Homeland Security Act of 2002, um, immigration judges are under the Department of Justice, so was the INS. So basically immigration judges, the people that were enforcing immigration laws, and the people that were detaining the children were all under the same department, which is crazy. Um, but the Department of Homeland Security, um, or the Homeland Security Act of 2002, put, put in in different places. So ORR, which is under the Department of Health and Human Services, now runs the facilities that house unaccompanied children. So the Children's Affairs section of the Homeland Security Act of 2002 is what transfers the responsibilities um, to ORR. Um, it also has a couple of other provisions. There's the release of recognizance for unaccompanied children. Um, it also encourages the use of refugee children foster care or placement of children, which I don't think has ever been put into place. Um, and, and finally, it defines UAC. So somebody with no status or 18, no parent or legal guardian in the U.S. are available to provide care and physical custody. Um, so I think, you know, this is hard to understand for people. Um, I went to a presentation by our the presiding judge, immigration judge, I forget his title, um, where he talked about how there's unaccompanied children with parents, so they're not actually in a company. And, and, and this is definitely confusing for a lot of people. So the, the designation of unaccompanied children happens at the time of apprehension. So basically the CBP officer looks around, says, you're, you're here without a parent or legal guardian, we're going to designate you a UAC. Um, and so they get transferred to ORR and go through the whole process. That is really a tattoo and not a stamp. You can't just rub it off. Um, so that UAC designation stays with the child throughout the pendency of their case. So even though a child is released then to a parent or the guardian, um, it doesn't matter. They're still going to be deemed unaccompanied for purposes of their removal proceedings. Um, and then there's the TVPRA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2008. Um, and it's a trafficking bill, 
so it talks a lot about trafficking, but it has some really good provisions for unaccompanied children. Um, it, it talks about the treatment of children that are from contiguous countries and non-contiguous countries. So there are special rules for children that are from contiguous countries, and obviously we mean Mexico. Um, so for Mexican children, the immigration can allow the child to withdraw their admission, um, their application for admission. So that doesn't have a bar. So a child, if, if they're apprehended, um, they can simply turn around and go back home. Um, unless the child is a victim of human trafficking or there's credible evidence that the child is at risk of being trafficked upon return, or the child has a fear of returning owing to a credible fear of persecution, or the child cannot make an independent decision to draw the application for admission, which I think is probably for the younger kids that can't just turn around and go home. Um, the Secretary of State is supposed to negotiate this agreement so that children are returned to appropriate employees. In Mexico, that's the deal. Um, or, and, and then also they're supposed to be returned at re during reasonable business hours. Um, and this screening for the Mexican children is to happen within 48 hours. There's also provisions in there for safe repatriation. So there's supposed to be a pilot program for safe repatriation and reintegration of UACs. Um, and it also calls for a report on repatriation to the Committee on Judiciary of the Senate and House of Representatives yearly. Um, it also, for kids that are from non-contiguous countries, um, places them in 240 removal proceedings. Also, voluntary departure is supposed to be at no cost to the child. That's what the statute says. Um, of course, there's no accompanying regulation, so what ends up happening is that children that are detained will get voluntary departure at no cost to the child, but children that are outside um, of detention there's no way to really ask for voluntary departure at no cost to them. Um, it also, you know, sets out some of the terms for care and custody of UAC. Um, it reiterates that care and custody is under the health, under ORR, Health and Human Services. Um, ORR, the, once a child is apprehended, they're supposed to notify ORR within 48 hours and then transfer a child within 72 hours. So all of that is, is, is very clear in the TBPRA. Um, and then it lays out some other, some other things as well, like safe and secure placement. It talks about that least restrictive setting language. Um, it talks about home studies. Um, it also contemplates the legal orientation programs for custodians that are handled through EOIR, or well, through legal services providers that get the funding from EOIR. Um, and um, it also has a provision in there for access to counsel. So the um, Health and Human Services is supposed to ensure, to the extent practicable, that all UACs have counsel to represent them in legal proceedings. Um, and it also talks about the child advocates in there as well. So the next section on the TVPRA is some of the permanent protections um, for, for the permanent protection for children. So I'm not going to say UAC because we all know that a child, even if they're not in UAC, they can still be, they can still ask for SIJ, a uh, special immigrant juvenile status. Um, so all of the changes um, that were made through the TVPRA of the SIJ statute are codified now. Um, so all you need to do is look at the new INA definition under 101-827-J. Um, it added custody to an individual um, as a way to um, as a way to get into the court, um, and then also struck eligibility for long-term foster care, and instead inserted that reunification with one or more family members. Um, it also struck express consent as a precondition. Um, and now it's simply consent. And then finally, um, it changed the specific consent for kids that were in ORR custody uh, from DHS to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, which is actually, um, we'll talk about more with the Paris Solano Settlement Agreement because that was the whole purpose of the litigation. Um, it's supposed to be, off, there's supposed to be expeditious adjudication. So within 180 days, that I-360 application is supposed to be adjudicated. 
Um, and, and that is actually codified. So you can find that at 8 U.S.C. 1232 C2. Um, and then, of course, Jordan talked about some of the adjustment provisions um, at 245H. So basically, it added some of those, it added additional grounds of inadmissibility for kids um, that are adjusting them as a special immigrant juvenile. Um, it also contemplates eligibility for assistance. Um, so basically, that is kids who are in ORR care and who get a dependency order while they're still in ORR care, those kids qualify for URN, or long -term, federal long-term foster care. Um, if you look at the, the, the statute right now, that's at 1232D4, you'll also see in there that kids who get a U visa while they're in ORR care also um, can get into the URN program, and that comes from BAWA 2013, so that's a little bit more recent. Um, and there, there is an age out protection provision in here um, that doesn't really help us. So basically, it, it's also codified, it's at 1232D4, um, and it says that a person cannot be denied SAJ status based on age if the alien was a child on the date on which they applied. So that doesn't help. That doesn't help for the kids um, that maybe turn 18 right after getting an order. So we'll talk. So this is why the parasol on the settlement agreement is really important. Um, this slide should actually say no updated regulations and policy guidance because there is no updated regulations and policy guidance in terms of the changes that were made to SAJ um, through the TBPRA. So if you look at the regulation 204.11, which talks about how somebody would be classified as a special immigrant juvenile or what the requirements are for classification, I should say. Um, 205.1 talks about the revocation provision, and then 245.1 talks about the adjustment provision. So none of those have been updated. The last time that the regulations were updated was in 1993, so before a lot of things happened. Um, so it doesn't contemplate that provision in 1994 or the change in 97 or 98. Um, the VAWA 2005, TVPRA, none of those changes are in the regulation. So you look at the regulation now, and it's um, completely outdated. There's still some provisions in there that are helpful, and they probably wouldn't change, but, but it definitely um, needs to be updated. Um, the, there was proposed regulations that were um, issued in 2011. A lot of people made comments on those proposed regulations. Um, and they still haven't, the regulations still have not been promulgated. Um, I think USCIS said that it would happen sometime next year, although they said that last year too. So um, we'll see if the, the regulations are actually updated. Um, this USCIS memo at least touches on the TVPRA and the changes that were made to the SAJ statute due to TVPRA, so it's somewhat helpful. Um, if you are trying to get any sort of policy guidance from USCIS, you're not going to find it. So right now, the USCIS is transferring their policy guidance from the Adjudicator's Field Manual um, to the USCIS Policy Manual. And so it's still behind on a lot of sections, but the, you'll find the section on SIJ um, in Chapter 22.32 of the AFM, um, and it's, it's completely outdated. So. Don't freak out if you read that, and there's provisions in there that you're not going to be able to meet. Um, and then finally, the, the other big change in the asylum for, for asylum for UACs, and this is specific to a UAC, um, comes in, is also from the TVPRA. So there's three major changes um, for children that are asking for asylum as a UAC. So the safe third country exception and the one-year filing deadline do not apply to UAC, and that is codified. So you can find it at INA 208A2E, um, and it's very clearly stated. If you're a UAC, then these two um, exceptions do not apply to you. Um, and then finally, the initial jurisdiction. Um, so if you're a UAC, then you get to go before the asylum office first to have your case adjudicated. That's also codified at 208 ECC. Um, so before 2013, the asylum office was basically redetermining UAC status. Um, 
and this was a, a policy policy procedure, right? So you so basically what would happen is that you would be in immigration court and say, yes, this child's a UAC, I'm gonna go to the asylum office. And then once you got to the asylum office for the interview, they would interview the child to figure out whether he was still a UAC. So they were treating the UAC status as a stamp and not a tattoo. Um, and they were saying, well, okay, we know that you were designated a UAC at the time of apprehension, but you're actually reunited with your mom, so you're no longer a UAC. Um, and, and, um, and then they would make the child go through the entire asylum interview, and then at the end, they would send a notice of lack of jurisdiction. So it would say, you know, yes, sorry, we made you go through this whole asylum interview, but you're not a UAC, so we don't have jurisdiction for your case. Um, the USCIS Ombudsman made a formal recommendation in 2012 for the asylum office to stop doing this, to, to just accept jurisdiction without redetermining UAC status. Um, and very soon afterwards, um, in 2013, um, USCIS issued their response and they said, okay, fine, we're going to stop redetermining USC, UAC status. So this memo here memorializes that, US, that, that new policy that USCIS will begin um, accepting jurisdiction for UAC as long as that UAC status wasn't terminated. So that's one of the other tricky situations. The only uh, way that UAC status can be terminated that I know of is if a child is in ORR care, turns 18, and is transferred to adult detention, then their UAC status is terminated. But that's it. No other, there's, there's not any other example that I know of where UAC status is terminated. So if a child was in ORR care and was released prior to his turning 18, um, and he's in, the, in, in, he's in removal proceedings, it doesn't matter if he's with a parent, it doesn't matter if he's already 18, he can still go before the asylum office first. And you can look at this memo and some of the frequently asked questions that are associated with this memo. Um, for clarification on that. I think, yeah. I think so. The, it says at the time of filing. So the memo and the FAQ says at the time of filing. So as long as you were a UAC at the time of filing, then you should be fine. Um, I know the asylum office in a couple of instances has gone out to adult detention centers to conduct asylum interviews. So um, I'm assuming they're accepting the jurisdiction. Any other questions on that? I know it's like hard for people to grasp, especially when Judge Brizak doesn't agree. Um, all right, Paris Solano. So that's the last litigation we're going to talk about. I think we're still good on time. Okay. All right. So the Paris Solano settlement agreement is important for those age out provisions for SIJ. Um, so the three claims, this was a case that was um, filed in 2005 as a class action lawsuit. Um, and basically, there were three claims that the plaintiffs made. Um, the first was, was the interpretation of the specific consent requirement. So basically what the, what, and this is in the statute, um, what it says is that no juvenile court has jurisdiction to determine the custody status or placement of an alien in the custody of, it was the Attorney General, but now it's the Secretary. Well, so okay, so you know, in the custody of the Attorney General, unless the Attorney General specifically consents to such jurisdiction. Um, so. Basically, the policy of DHS, because um, obviously it went from, after the Homeland Security Act, it went from the Attorney General to the Secretary of Department of Homeland Security. So basically, the policy of DHS was that this provision required in-custody kids to obtain ICE-specific consent before they were able to go into state court. Um, the reason that they decided this was that they said that the government finds that any dependency order for a child in custody is going to necessarily alter the child's custody status or placement. But we know that's not necessarily true. Um, if, a, if a child is in ORR custody and gets a dependency order, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to alter the custody um, of the child. But this is the way that 
that Department of Homeland Security was interpreting it, and they were being re really strict and not uh, approving a lot of the requests for specific consent. So they were basically having the child um, present the SIJ case to them, and then ICE would decide whether or not they would allow the child to go into the court to seek SIJ findings. Um, another, the, the second claim for the plaintiffs was the age out regulations. Um, and so if you look at the regulations at 204.11 and 205.1, the revocation provisions, you'll see on there that basically SIJ status or adjustment can be denied if the child is, um, doesn't have a valid dependency order at the time of adjudication. Um, the revocation provision says that if the dependency order um, uh, ceases, so if the, if the dependency order is no longer valid at the time of adjudication in the, or at the time of adjudication of the adjustment, um, uh, adjustment of status, then it can be revoked. So there was definitely no protection for kids that were aging out of the system were turning 18 and their dependency order was no longer valid or were turning 21. Um, um, where they would just be out of luck with SIJ. And then the final, um, the final claim by the plaintiffs was another regulation. So this regulation actually is still intact. So basically, if a child is in removal proceedings um, and they have SIJ status, they have to seek adjustment of status before the court, right? because the, the immigration judge is the one that has jurisdiction to hear the case. Um, well, the plaintiffs were claiming that this regulation wasn't fair to SIJ applicants, which because SIJ adjustment of status could be heard by USCIS, but if the judge didn't terminate proceedings, then they'd have to stick it out in immigration court. Um, and the other, um, the other issue um, was that if a child um, had a removal order, then they would have to ask for a motion to reopen to the court before being able to proceed with their um, adjustment application. So, basically, the, the district court judge in this case found for the plaintiffs on the first issue on that specific consent, but um, did not agree with them on the second two, on the, the age out regulation provision and then the um, having to do your adjustment of status application before the immigration judge. Um, so instead of continuing litigation, the parties decided to settle, and that's how we get the Paris Solano Settlement Agreement. Um, so the, the, one of the things that TBPRA did is that it no longer requires specific consent from the Department of Homeland Security, but it moved it over to the um, Department of Health and Human Services. So instead of asking for specific consent from ICE, they were asking for specific consent from ORR. And basically what ORR did right after the TBPRA is say, okay, um, we're gonna only require specific consent if you actually alter custody. So that changed in terms of policy. So that the, the Paris Alano Settlement Agreement doesn't even touch really, well, it does. It, it, basically reiterates what the policy of the Department of Health and Human Services is, that if you're in custody, you only have to ask for specific consent if you're gonna alter custody at some point. Um, but one of the, well, there's two important things in, in this um, settlement agreement that are important, that are important. So one of them is the age out protection. So if, um, so USCIS, shall not deny or revoke SIJ classification or adjustment status on account of age or dependency status if at the time of filing they were under 21 or subject to a valid dependency order um, that was subsequently terminated because of age. Um, so this is great. This means that all the kids that we work with that, that um, age out of the system don't have a valid dependency order after 18 or even age out completely turn um, 21, as long as something was filed before they turn 21, uh, as long as the SIJ application, so the I-360, as long as the I-360 application was filed before they turn 21, then they should be fine. Um, unfortunately, USCIS was not abiding by the settlement agreement. Um, so in 2014, they were, 2014, they were denying I-360 applications for kids that were 
that did not have a valid dependency order at the time they filed. So let's say a kid um, got, a, got an order before 18 and then couldn't get a certified copy of the state court order until five days after they turned 18 and that's when they filed the I-360, then USCIS is saying, sorry, too bad. You, didn't, you weren't um, subject to a valid dependency order and so that's why we're going to deny your I-360. So, um, of course, there was a uh, um, motion for enforcement of the, of the settlement agreement, and that's, um, and that's how we got this later stipulation. Um, so it's very, very clear. Um, this, well, I didn't talk about, so, okay, so it's very clear, and this determination date of this stipulation is not over until June 15, 2018, so we have quite some time for those age out protections. One of the other things, and I didn't talk about, I skipped over it, um, that's covered in the um, previous settlement agreement, which will actually exist in December, so December of this year, um, is the motion to reopen. So one of the arguments that the plaintiffs were making was, well, if we get a removal order, then we have to you know, ask for a motion to reopen, and what if the ICE council doesn't agree to a motion to reopen, that, and, and we're out of the timeline, then what do we do? So the, the Paris Olano, the initial Paris Olano settlement agreement says that an, the ICE has to um, join you in a motion to reopen if you let them know that you have an I-360 approval. So this is great for kids that have 360 approval and have a previous order of removal. They have to join. Unfortunately, use it while you can. This eclipses in December of this year. They should still do it. They should. So you can you can still argue that. Uh, all right. So I think we'll just spend the last like five minutes just going over, over some tips um, for research, just because I didn't want all of you to feel overwhelmed with the amount of information that I was giving you. Um, you know, freak out and say, how am I supposed to keep up with all of this? It's always changing. Um, there's always new rules and there's litigation and there's policy and how am I supposed to keep up with all of this? So um, these are just my tips for, for handling any case really um, in terms of immigration because there's a lot of different places where you have to look. But I would always recommend that you start with the INA. So start with the statutory guidelines. And the wonderful thing about immigration, I know a lot of people don't think this is wonderful, but the wonderful thing about immigration is that it is code-based. So everything is written down. Um, so it's great. You look up the, you, you look at the INA and lots, there's lots of guidance there. Um, so I would look at it every time you're starting a new case. I mean, I, I don't know how many times I've looked at the SAJ statute and I've done, you know, dozens of these cases. Um, the second thing I would look at are the regulations. Of course, the government's a little bit slow to update some of the regulations, but it's still really helpful, um, especially when you're doing applications for any of the crime victims, for youth and teens and VAWA. There's lots of really helpful information in the regulations, and hopefully, maybe there'll be some helpful regulations as well in the FAJ statute. Um, and there's helpful regulations for asylum as well. So I would encourage you to look at them every single time. Um, and then in terms of keeping abreast of the policy guidance, um, for USCIS, you're always going to want to look at the adjudicator's field manual or the USCIS policy manual. So um, start with the adjudicator's field manual and, and in there when you look on the when you look on the USCIS website in any case, um, it, it tells you if it's um, and update it and move it over to the policy manual, so you won't get lost. Um, and of course, USCIS loves to issue policy memoranda, and it, they're on the website, all of the policy memoranda, so you can actually search for it by subject, um, which is great, so you can find all of that on there as well. Um, and then finally, you can review the case law. So, for the IV60, they're going to run a review of the AAO opinion, the Administrative Appeals Office opinion. Um, you can, for cases that are in removal proceedings, you're, you want to look at the Board of Immigration Appeals decision. 
Um, and then you look at the Fifth Circuit, if it went beyond that, and, and then, or if you need guidance. Of course, the Fifth Circuit is not great on all things, so you can look at other places like the Ninth Circuit and try to argue that the Fifth Circuit should follow the Ninth Circuit. Um, and then you also can look at Supreme Court decisions. So, where to research? Um, one of, I mean, I'll just say it. It's, USCIS is actually one of my favorite websites to look at. Um, it, it's very user friendly, um, so the guidance is easily accessible. Um, under the law section uh, of the website, you can look up the INA, ATFR, um, which is usually where I look when I'm looking at the, the statute and regulations because, it, um, like I said, it's user friendly. Um, you can look up administrative decisions there and the policy manual and the memorandum. It's all on, available on USCIS. Um, and then if you're, if you're doing some research report, of course, you look at the EOIR website, which is not too bad, um, justice.gov slash EOIR. Um, there's actually a virtual law library on there um, where you can look at BIA decisions. Unfortunately, it's not very search searchable, um, but you can still find some of the BIA decisions on there. Um, there's country conditions research on there, so it gives you at least a list of the most commonly used country conditions reports. Um, and then there's this great publication called the Immigration Law Advisor that comes out every month and it kind of goes over a main topic um, and then it goes over all of the um, circuit court decisions that were important. Or does it come out quarterly? It might come out quarterly. Um, uh, that, that happened previous to its publication. Um, if you're barred in Texas, you can go onto the State Bar of Texas website and sign in and there's an online legal research tool on there. There's actually two databases, Peacemaker and Fastcase, um, if you want to look up Texas law specifically, um, which you're going to want to do for your SIJ pieces, and that's free. Um, and then finally, there's this great research that I found just recently, the Texas State Law Library. You go onto this website and you request a library card, an online library card, um, and they have so many resources on there. And one of my the things that I discovered, which is really great, is that it gives you free access to ALO Link, where curse bands is available. So the updated curse bands is there. It's amazing. Um, so I encourage all of you to get your um, your online library card and and use those resources every day, all the time. All right, that's it. Thank you. Um, any questions? 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 Yes. Yeah, so there's some there's actually some federal litigation going on around that issue. Um, so there's two separate issues when it comes to post 18 cases in Texas. One is the declaratory judgment cases, declaratory judgment cases, and then the other one is the child support cases. So for the child support cases, there's um, litigation going on right now in the Western District, um, and, and so we'll see what they're trying to certify a class there for all kids that receive an order after 18 for child support and USCIS has denied their I-360. Um, so we'll see what happens with that, uh, whether the district court rules in favor of the, um, of the plaintiff. Um, the AAO is not, doesn't seem like, the, uh, USCIS and the AAO doesn't seem like it's going to budge on that issue. So um, in terms, you know, nothing's going on currently on the, on the post 18 territory judgments except a lot of uh, work on answering um, but, but in terms of the child support order, these are some things going on, and um, it's more grounded in law, so you can point to a specific provision in the state code, um, which I think is really helpful. Um, yeah, 
Pak Umi ya. Anybody else? Yeah. That's a good question. I mean, obviously there's conflicting things there, right? The child is allowed to request bond, but is the child, but then there's also who's going to be the caregiver who's going to take care of that child, and can they just release the child, and that's it. I think, I'm not sure how it's playing out. Obviously, you know, part of the reason why there's this enforcement action of the floor settlement agreement is that the, um, uh, ORR was not allowing the child to ask for a bond redetermination, so maybe we'll see in, in terms of the settlement, hopefully with the settlement or in terms of litigation, what is supposed to happen for a child if they are given a bond by, by an immigration judge. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess you, you know, you can keep fighting with ORR on, on releasing a child. Um, you know, the Supreme Court case is not on our side, right? So if the government claims an interest, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be over the best interest of the child, which would be to release the parent, then the government can make that determination because, you know, the plenary, plenary power and all of that. Um, so, and I've seen also some district court cases where um, a child has gone to district court to try to get out of detention uh, for this exact same reason. And unfortunately, the district courts are not really in favor of clean. So I think it's just a matter of continued local advocacy. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to be the bad guy and cut off Dahlia right now. So we're running on time. We'll be available during the breaks, lunch, and of course, always doing our normal technical assistance. So if you could ask Thank afterwards. you, and we're 10 minutes.